Hi everyone, I'm John Lin, the founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today. We're excited to bring you a really interesting discussion about disasters and healthcare's response during disasters. And our guest is Lauren Kneiser. She's senior director at Audacious Inquiry. Welcome, Lauren. Hi, John. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, so before we dive into the topic today, tell us a little bit about yourself and Audacious Inquiry. Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. So Audacious Inquiry um, is a national health IT company been around for about 20 years and actually the largest network of its kind. Um, we focus on coordinated care um, and connected care for patients and providers, which really in practice means that we are getting actionable, timely data um, and accurate data to healthcare providers in those moments of care that are most critical for their patients. Um, I came to Audacious Inquiry in 2020, uh, in January, just before the COVID-19 response, wow. which was a little <laughs> intense. Yes, um, and I came to run our preparedness portfolio, which includes Pulse, the patient unified lookup system for emergencies. Uh, and I actually don't have any health IT background. Um, I come from the preparedness and response world. Um, and so it really was a big transition and learning experience for me coming to a health IT company. Um, but that being said, in my, my previous roles, uh, I really had a front row seat to all of the challenges um, that were experienced related to data sharing across hospitals, healthcare systems, public health departments, local, state, and federal responders. Um, and it got me really passionate about how modern health IT solutions could really help my professional community. Yeah. No, I think it's great because Audacious Inquiry obviously has the expertise on the healthcare side of things. So they needed someone like you, I imagine. So talk more about Pulse. Like what is it, you know, what's the background? How was it started? Sure, uh, so, so simply stated, Pulse is really a web-based application or you know, a website uh, where authorized providers can log in and access patients' clinical and medication histories. Uh, and it's really meant to be used in alternate care facilities, which are shelter environments or temporary environments that are stood up during disasters. It's not really meant to be used in places that already have an EHR, or really okay. good HIE connectivity. It's for those, those gaps in care um, that are experienced during disasters and public health emergencies. Um, yeah, and so Audacious Inquiry has a long history with Pulse that predates me coming to the company. Uh -huh. um, in 2014, uh, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT commissioned a report that Audacious Inquiry worked on um, asking, you know, how can health IT help the disaster community? How can it help in disasters and public health emergencies? Uh, and that report found two use cases, one being medication history access for providers and shelters, which led to Pulse, uh -huh. and the other actually being bi-directional information sharing for EMS and hospitals, which is still a need today, <laughs> <laughs> I will add. I'm sure. Um, and so, yeah, long story short, um, ONC and HHS continued to invest in the development of um, a health IT solution that became Pulse. Uh, Aud Audacious Inquiry worked with really great state level partners in California, uh, California Emergency Medical Services Authority, who we okay. still work with today, uh, to make sure that the tool really met the needs of frontline healthcare providers in emergency response scenarios. Um, and then in 2019, ONC invested a little bit more um, so that we could make Pulse extensible uh, nationally and really expand the successes that were experienced in California to other states in the country. Yeah, so I think we want to dive into some examples, you know, shortly. But like before we dive into that, like what are some of the real challenges and, and the impact on patients during a, a disaster? Yeah, so um, the post-disaster healthcare environment can be very complex, right? Yeah. Um, patients and providers are often displaced or have evacuated from the area. Um, your hospitals and your um, you know, primary care offices, other specialty offices may be closed, they may have been damaged. Uh, infrastructure is often disrupted and so people reliant on public transportation may not be able to get where they're trying to go. Uh, and so all of that has ramifications on patient care, of course, um, and in particular on patients who have chronic care needs, uh, which as we know in this country is really, really prevalent. Um, yeah, and absolutely. so after disasters, you know, I, I feel it's an often overlooked um, part of the patient care journey, uh, but we really need to be preparing and making sure that we can continue to coordinate care for those people who require routine services, uh, require routine medications, uh, and make sure that they don't experience a lapse in access to care. Yeah, 
I mean, I, I just think back to Katrina. You know, that's the one right. I think is so obvious for everyone. And and it's kind of sad. I mean, we were talking about this the other day. When I met you, it's like, you know, you wait for the disaster to finally pay attention. And when Katrina happened, we had like 600 health IT sessions about, oh, what do you do when if Katrina hits your organization? But, I, you know, it's like there were so many examples of patients who couldn't get access to their medication. And they'd go, you know, to the doctor and they're like well I could prescribe it but I don't know what you're on and so right. I think those are the challenges right right yeah and those the challenges are still very real today in particular in those um, alternate care environments those temporary environments mm -hmm. yeah and so let's talk about some of the examples I mean it, you have done a lot of work I think with the California wildfires obviously it sounds like since you started in California that right. makes sense so give us an example of how this worked in in real life and the impact it had in, in California yeah, I think you can dive down kind of to the patient level. Um, and so some examples from California, um, you know, there was a, a, a woman who brought her baby in um, and the baby actually had a medication allergy. Um, and because they used Pulse there, they were able to identify that allergy and of course not prescribe a medication that would have resulted in an adverse experience. Um, and that would have been a news story if it had, right? So it's, like, but it's almost not a story because you, you didn't have the adverse reaction. Well, that's what we want, right? Yeah, like no, that's preparedness in action. <laughs> when you prepare correctly, you, you don't hear about it. You don't know about it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's what's challenging, though. Any absolutely. Others? It's a hard sell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in California, um, they also actually had deployed Pulse to take care of the firefighters who were putting out the fires. Okay. Uh, and so... You know, it's another important use case for us to remember that often our healthcare workers and our frontline response personnel also need maintenance of their um, continuity of, you know, chronic care as well as any exacerbation they might be experienced from the exposure to the disaster itself. Yeah. Um, and so it's really great to be able to provide care to those frontline responders as well. Yeah, and it's a challenging thing, especially with wildfires where, you know, they're suffering their own health challenges because of the nature of the job, I imagine. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So you also do some work with family reunification. So tell us a little bit about that and how that works after disasters or I guess maybe how it doesn't work when you don't have the right solutions. <laughs> right. It's challenging today. Uh, and so as part of Pulse, we have a feature or a capability that we call emergency census and that's our reunification feature. Um, and, um, you know, if you think about a scenario after a disaster. So I've got kids. Mm -hmm. um, and at any given point during the day, especially during the week, they're at two different schools. Um, before COVID-19 happened, my husband and I worked at different parts of the city. So we're on opposite sides of the city, our kids in two different schools. Yeah. If something were to happen in Washington, DC, um, which is a target for all yeah. kinds of different incidents and events, um, we would very likely be separated. Um, and, you know, I mean, for you, John, like, what is the first thing you would do if you were looking for a loved one? Well, it's shocking to me because literally before we did this interview, mm -hmm. I got a text that my kid's school was on lockdown. <laughs> so, You're right. Like, <laughs> and so what, so I know what relevant. I did. I texted my son and I said, what's right. going on? <laughs> so my kids are five and two, so they don't have phones. Uh, um, I can't text them. Personally, I would probably call their schools. If the schools didn't answer, I might try to call friends and family and see if people could you know, go over there if they're closer. Yeah. Um, if that didn't work, you know, if days or hours past, um, I might start thinking what if something happened to my kids and start calling around to hospitals and, yeah. you know, urgent care centers, anybody who might have seen them. Um, and you can imagine how that would be, first of all, terrifying. <laughs> Second of all, time consuming, frustrating, um, and also create a burden on the facilities that are answering these phone calls at the same time that they're trying to care for all of these patients who've been impacted. Yeah. Uh, and with Health IT, we can do better than that. Um, and what Emergency Census does is it taps into our coordinated care network uh, where we have access to admission, discharge, and transfer information. Mm -hmm. And so I, as a parent, can call a reunification specialist, give my kids information to the specialist, have them check the health IT records for any ad admit, discharge, or transfer yeah. that matches my, my child, and essentially tell me if they showed up in a hospital or emergency department somewhere. 
Yeah, that's an amazing service. Uh, you know, my daughter doesn't have a cell phone, so and she's in the same school. And so we're like, oh wait, now what do I do? So I understand that emotion. Right. And obviously we're here in Las Vegas where October 1st we had the incident. Right. And we saw that people couldn't find their family members. They were mm -hmm. literally running and hopping in Jeeps and getting transported to the hospital because there was such a big incident. And so people were trying to find them. Of course, then, you know, the cell phone towers get overloaded, et cetera, exactly. et cetera, right? So I, I, that, that sounds like a really great service. So what would you kind of, you know, tell states and emergency management officials? What do they need to understand about the role of health IT and, and how that can play in future emergencies or, or other disasters? That's a great question, and uh, like I said at the beginning, I don't come from the health IT community. I have very little experience um, prior to coming to Audacious um, in this field, uh, but I did get really passionate thinking that there are solutions and technologies out here that can help my community that we're just not leveraging. Um, and I think that's true, and I would love for the response community and emergency management officials um, to really take a good look at what's out there mm -hmm. um, and know that health IT has advanced incredibly in the last 10 to 15 years, and there are capabilities that can really help our use cases. And there are also companies out there like ours um, that are willing to invest and to work with the frontline response community and figure out how to meet those needs. Do you think they just haven't looked into it because there's so many challenges they already face or that they're just not aware of it or, you know? <laughs> I think it's a combination of things. Um, I will say for me, it was really just not much of an awareness of this field, um, right. you know, and, and not um, knowing what kind of advancements have happened and not knowing how those have been leveraged in regular healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, so some of it's maybe just a lack of awareness. We're all focused on, on different things, have different roles. Um, and I think some of it um, is kind of like you just alluded to that unfortunately all too often we don't focus on the issue until a disaster happens yeah. and in the heat of the yeah, moment the is <laughs> the exact wrong time to implement something new and to change a procedure right. and to make people use a new service or technology uh, and so unfortunately that reactive culture and that reactive nature holds us back from having far more sophisticated processes and procedures yeah well, as a self-proclaimed health IT nerd, uh, we probably have the opposite one. So I appreciate you coming here and educating us on some of the challenges we face during disasters. So thank you so much. Thank you again for, for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks everyone for watching. If you want to find more great healthcare IT content like this, be sure to check it out at healthcareittoday.com. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you again.